Hello to everybody. Welcome to the Southwestern Writers Collection and the Whitliff Gallery of Southwestern and Mexican Photography. I'm Connie Todd. I'm the curator. So glad to see you. I think I see a number of faces of people I haven't seen before up here, and so we're glad to have some newbies. Uh, don't forget your way to the collection. It's not once you find your way, we feel that you can come here again. So, uh, so just remember how you got here. One of the first blues songs that I ever learned, and it's, I don't know, it's been so long ago, I don't even remember the circumstances of it, but it might have been called Good Morning Blues, but, but the lines, some of the lines went, I've got the blues so bad, it hurts my feet to walk. I got the blues so bad, it hurts my feet to walk. I've got the blues so bad, it hurts my tongue to talk. And fortunately, I don't have the blues tonight. I'm happy to tell everybody here that we're, we're going to celebrate this evening the gift to the Southwestern Writers Collection of, of something very special from Lucky and Becky Tomlin and Silver Star Entertainment. And that would be the gift of the interview and production materials from the making of Antone's Home of the Blues a documentary film about the legendary Clifford Antone and his great Austin nightclub. And I just want to thank Lucky and Becky and Sil Silver Star very much right now. Thank you so much. <clears throat> We're delighted to have in attendance tonight President South Texas State President Denise Trout is here with us. Denise. <laughs> also, J Joan Heath, who's the Assistant Vice President and the head of the Alcac Library. There's Joan. And, uh, and Van Wyatt, who is our Vice President for Information Technology, our, our Vice President. <laughs> We're honored as well to have Susan Antone here. Uh, she'll be sharing some memories later on. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming, Susan. Where are you? There you are. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize Silver Star exec Denise Boudreaux. <laughs> she was instrumental in the whole process of the gifting. Uh, and, and also Mike Lawrence, who is, is Mike here? Is he here? There, yes. He, He's an attorney. I mean, uh, Denise told me, she said, well, you know, he kept me out of the trees. And uh, he did all of the, he did all of the permissions and so forth and the clearances. And really it's owing to his labor that that DVD is on sale this evening. So, uh, so we owe him a big debt of gratitude. Mike and Denise, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Denise lined up. The musicians who will be playing for us later on, Lou Ann Barton, Derek O'Brien, Scott Nelson, and Jay Muller. So we're very happy to have them with us. Lucky Tomlin's going to say a few words in a minute. Yes, absolutely, yes. We'll have a chance to clap for them. Uh, Lucky's going to speak in a, in a minute or two, but before I introduce him, I'd like to just talk just a, a little bit about the gift of the film archives. There are over 300 tapes of raw footage that were used in the film um, that are part of the Tomlin gift, along with publicity materials and other items uh, related to the documentary's production and screening. If any of you would like to see the archives, they're on view in the reading room, which is the red room to the right as you're going toward the food. There's no food left, but if you were going toward the food, on the right is the red room, and that's where the archives are. Uh, we also put out some of Joe Nick Petoskey's uh, and, and Bill Crawford's archives of the work that they did on the Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, biography, Caught in the Crossfire. Uh, that included some promotional items from Antone's as well as an interview with Clifford. That uh, transcript is out. And we have three posters, old music posters from Antone's, uh, as well as a handbill that I was just asking Susan about. Uh, it's it's uh, Clifford Chenier, and uh, and and it, I thought it might be from the very first performance at Antone's, and she uh, affirmed the fact that it was from 1975. So that's in there too. It's really 
a very old ephemeral piece of piece of uh, music history from Austin. Um, most of you here probably know a lot more about Clifford Anton than I do, and uh, but the thing that has always impressed me about the man and his club is the fact that he shared a mission actually very similar with that of the Southwestern Writers Collection. At the library, we gather, preserve, and share the cultural legacy of the Southwest. Clifford gathered together, presented, and taped blues legends from all over the country so that their legacy could be shared with whomever came through the door of Antone's. It was like elementary school, middle school, high school, college, grad school, post-grad, uh, for anybody who was a student of the blues on any level. Clifford knew that it was through performance that this great art form was communicated to new generations of musicians and also to people who might not be musicians but simply fans of the blues. And Clifford was the library. Uh, I, I went to some of his classes here at Texas State on the history of blues and rock and roll, and he really was amazing in his command of his material. The large picture he got because he knew all of the small details and could put them all together. He was like, he, he knew all the stats and he took, I mean, he took great pleasure in sharing that information. It, of course, makes his death all the more tragic because there's the old adage about every time a person dies, it's like a library burning down. And that's certainly precisely true in Clifford's case. Uh, I know that there are a lot more archives out there that have to do with Antone's and with Clifford's activities <coughs> on behalf of the Blues. We're very grateful to have the ones that we've received from Lucky and Becky and Silver Star. We'll keep them safe, we'll make them available to researchers as long as there are people who are interested in the Blues, which I think will be pretty much forever. Uh, regardless of where the other materials wind up, and of course I hope they wind up here, uh, but I hope they, they end up in a safe place, a library where they can be taken care of and shared with others. Lucky Tomlin is the executive producer of Antone's Home of the Blues. He's the founder and the owner of Silver Star Entertainment. He's a band leader and a songwriter. And I think he might be an attorney too. Somebody <laughs> said he was. I think he is. He founded the Fire Station Recording Studio and Film Studio in San Marcos. He recorded C.V. Ray Vaughan there and the Texas Tornadoes and many others. He's a Texas State alum, he's a Bobcat, and he helped start the university sound technology program, which is now one of the most popular on campus and also one of the most difficult to get into. Uh, he heads up the Lucky Tomlin Band. I believe you can catch him next Wednesday. Is it next Wednesday at the Broken Spoke? I think so. First Wednesday, is that right? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> and it's definitely worth the drive for those of you who don't live in Austin. Uh, he's been, they've been here at Cheatham Street. They've been at venues really all over the country. And I hear there's talk that, uh, that they may be going to Paris. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's just a rumor. No, it's true, they are going to Paris. And, uh, and, and I think France will be a great venue for, for Tomlin's band. Lucky is a great supporter of, uh, of Texas music and, uh, and a wonderful musician in his own right. And I'd like for him to come up. He's gonna come up and say, say some words. Thank you for all that. that was, those were very kind remarks. Uh, I'm not sure what I can say after that. But I just want to say a few words about Clifford because uh, he was a very, very good friend. And I mean that. You can People say that all the time, this guy's a good friend. <clears throat> but when you had a friend uh, like Clifford Antone, he had you back. And he had it every time. Uh, Clifford lived the blues. He knew everything about the blues. He knew every person that ever played the blues. He knew what guitar they used. 
He knew what sound they had. He just was a genius, and I miss him. I really do. I don't know uh, how to say it, but he, there's a big hole in, in the world right now in, in, in the loss of, of all that he stood for and his amazing character and his amazing strength. So I, I just want to say that I'm very, very privileged to have known him and to uh, have him call me his friend. And I want to make a special thanks uh, for Susan Antone uh, being here tonight. Um, <coughs> I want to thank uh, and, and give credit for those who, who helped make the film, and there were so many I'll never be able to give them all to you tonight, but Dan Carlock, I want you to know, directed the film. Colleen Sorrow was a co-producer uh, of the film. Uh, Gary Hickenbotham, who is here. Uh, there he is right there. Uh, was uh, greatly instrumental with the sound of the film. He, and, and it sounds great. And he had a big job to do. You know, how are you going <laughs> to be responsible for, <laughs> you know, B.B. King? Uh, and Bobby Arnold, who has done so much to make this happen. Bobby Arnold is another <laughs> wonderful uh, individual who has uh, participated in, and helped us get this all together. Uh, and Mike Lawrence, who has, uh, is with us here tonight, I believe, and, and he uh, has worked so diligently, and he had the, uh, maybe the hardest job, I don't know, because he did all the legal work and kept track of all of the, the uh, uh, niceties that are required and, and, uh, to, to, to be put into place and to make sure that e everything uh, doesn't get sent off to somewhere you don't want it sent. Uh, and, and he has done an amazing job. Uh, thank you, Mike. And last but not least, I saved her for last because she has worked, uh, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of hours and never complained and just jumps in at every, every time she's asked. Miss Denise Boudreau. <laughs> this film wouldn't have been made without Denise, and I thank her and all those folks. And now uh, I just thank you all for being here. I just want to tell you what a great pleasure it was for me to to have anything at all to do with this film but you know when uh, I, I didn't even know this but when you become what they call the executive producer you get to go everywhere <laughs> you know you don't have to ask if you can go somewhere <laughs> and get up there and go backstage so it was really fun I had a ball and uh, I'm glad that uh, you all are here and I hope that you uh, enjoy the film thank you very much I want to I want to make us uh, if I haven't said this I want to thank Texas State for allowing us to to uh, to keep uh, this footage here for all time. We're going to see some clips from the documentary now. Um, and, and let me just say that it premiered at the 2004 South by Southwest um, Festival. It, it received in 2007 a Keeping the Blues Alive Award, which was presented by the Blues Foundation in Memphis, Tennessee. This award recognizes the significant contributions to the blues that are made by the people who work behind the scenes. The following clips that uh, you'll see, you're going to see rare interviews, uh, previously unseen performances, as well as some testimonials from some special guest stars, including B.B. King, Willie Nelson, Billy Gibbons, Buddy Guy, Joe Ely, Marsha Ball, and Kim Wilson. So please enjoy the film.
big freak. You, you better believe he got a well I put it like this. He's a blues man. Well, my first impression of him was that he was just crazy in love with blues and anything to do with it. You know, he just was, the music was just holy to him. I'm sitting down talking to Clifford, and he's like bringing up some things I didn't think nobody would know but a black guy about blues. And I'm like saying, wait a minute, man, I got to have a drink and talk to you. Who are you? You know, and this is the kind of thing that he brought there, and he knew as much about the blues as I did. He was the guy that long before other people started to, as we use the word, latch on to the blues, he knew about them, supported them, promoted them. He did it all. So I think we that play the blues or in this field owe him a lot. It's been my life, it's been my family, it's been my wife, it's been everything, you know. It's the, the club is my life. Music and presenting music is my life, you know, that's what I've done. Somebody took me down to 6th Street and he said, man, there's this new spot and there's this guy, Clifford Antone, and he started this club. And it was a blues club, it was being touted as, as a place to uh, feature blues. See, 6th Street also at that time, it wasn't like it is now, it was low down down there. Before Antone's, it wasn't like, hey, let's go down to 6th Street tonight unless you were probably, you know, looking for something you shouldn't be looking for. We weren't ready for 6th Street. You didn't go down there. I mean, you could, there were some liquor stores, you know, but Clifford was the first. It was right here, 1975. We came down here on, on 6th Street and there wasn't anything open at night. That was the first established place that really catered to the blues. It seemed to just grow out of the ground. It, I don't remember the exact time it opened or anything. It just seemed like it just happened, you know. Clifford was always there. One summer day. You couldn't separate the club from the man, you know. It was, it was all in one. And we just thought it was the greatest place on earth. <laughs> I didn't choose it, it chose me, you know. It's, I've never had any control over it. it. I often have asked myself, why me, you know? from a part of Texas, that Golden Triangle down there, where people really love music and they love to dance to it. You know, it comes from that strange part of the planet down there, the Golden Triangle, Beaumont and Groves and Nederland and all the way over into Louisiana, that algae-covered richness, you know, it's just, I don't know, there's something about it, it's, Im it's imbibed. And the blues is just something I never had to learn. I just never knew anything but the blues. Damn. This was, this was uh, Lou Ann's, this was the After Hours Club. The Big Oaks was right down the street. This is where you had the most low down Louisiana blues and Zydeco bands you ever heard in your life. You didn't call it blues, you didn't call it nothing, you know, it was just the band. Jeez Louise, man. Very conducive around here to making music, you know. It's, uh, it, it inspires people to be soulful. This is what formed our minds musically, especially me. It hit, it hit me really hard over here, you know. You could stay out all night and drink and dance with big girls with big hair, and I still can't really dance with a girl without Aquanet in her hair, you know. I mean, it's just not right, you know. Right next door was the Big Oaks, and that's the finest club I've ever seen. It was magic, it was, people came from all over, and they were very devoted to that club and the Boogie Kings. The Boogie Kings is the band that inspired me, and that's a standard still to this day by which I judge music and bands. The Big Oaks Club right here in Benton and the Boogie Kings, that's why I do what I do today. The amazing thing about the early Antones when I think about it is that we had the masters of American music and the guys that made rock and roll and blues and everything else, what it is, passed through the, that club on 6th Street. B.B. King, Muddy Waters, Willie Dixon, the guy that wrote every great song in the world. I just remember seeing all those anniversary shows with all those guys lined up across the stage, and it was like, this is a history of Chicago blues. I mean, here's all of them, Cotton and uh, Junior Wells and 
Buddy Guy and Robert Jr. Lockwood and Hubert Sumlin and Eddie Taylor. And it just goes on across the stage and it just keeps going. And, and Pine Top, Jimmy Rogers. Jimmy Rogers would come down for two weeks, three weeks. You know, as far as an opportunity to learn from the, the guys that you admired, and you know, I was into Freddie King, and Freddie King learned how to play from Jimmy Rogers and Eddie Taylor. So I was able to meet all three of those guys and actually play with them. They were actually the guys that inspired each other. And you know what I mean? That's the way blues is. It goes all the way around. And so I got to learn from the same people, you know, that my heroes did also. timers thought Eddie Taylor and Jimmy Rogers and those guys they were so loyal and that, that's a beautiful thing in this music business this is upstairs on 6th Street we had that big fan and up there facing that's when we brought Jimmy Reed and Eddie Taylor that was the first time they'd been together in 10 years from Chicago man behind all the Jimmy Reed records and all his own great records a big town playboy Mr. Eddie Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. guy who had formed part of the basis of what was really American popular music in the early 60s on these Jimmy Reed records, which charted not only they got in the high in the top 10 on the R&B charts on Billboard, but also they were on the pop charts too, they crossed over. So here was a guy who was really forgotten, but who had, who, he was the part of the Jimmy Reed song that people danced to. Special dedicated to Mr. Clifford, okay? first brought B.B. King in the 75, 76 period. I don't know that I'd ever met a man like that before that was that nice and that intelligent. Any of us that have ever met him, I've been around him any length of time, always praise him. He treated me so nice. I was just a kid. And we're grateful to him because he opened up a lot of doors, a lot of doors. He's on stage playing, and I'm sitting there wide-eyed listening to him, and he, he kind of takes the band down a little, and he starts saying, introduce and he says, now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to my boss. I'm thinking, who's his boss? No, I call him up there, and I want the people to meet the boss man. My boss, Mr. Clifford Anton. Oh, no, sir, I'm not your boss. <laughs> I think I made him shame, but <laughs> I said, folks, this is the boss man. So finally, I had to walk up there, and I was really, I was, nervous. He took off his guitar and handed it to me. You know he wasn't going to take that. He said, okay, go ahead and play it, and walks off the stage. And then he's a little shy to play Lucille anyway. I, was, I couldn't play anything. I was petrified. And most of the guys that's living today that play or have played blues appreciate him. I'm one of the oldest and I do. I appreciate him. I got the blues. I'm gonna pack my things and go.
Tucker had lived in in uh, San Francisco for many years, and uh, all the older guys in Chicago who raised him hadn't seen him in 10 and 15 years, some of them, and, until he came to the anniversaries and played with them. And it was like their young brother they, they hadn't seen in all those years. It was a beautiful thing. That's the blues. Definitely one of the greatest musicians in the world, and, and he made a big contribution in the Chicago scene with with so many people, but especially with Little Walter. never going to know what a great genius he was, but he was as genius as anyone in any kind of music that ever existed. And there's very, very few people on earth who could ever play the Chicago blues on drums right. Very few. Willie Smith is one of the few guys left that knows how to play blues. By 75, we were, we was pretty much at the top of the game. So we, we, we met them, you know, big and small, tall and short, <laughs> no matter what, we met them. Right. Hey, what you do? You got another man, and you can't keep it here. I never would have asked people like Muddy and uh, B.B. and <laughs> anybody, Buddy and Al the Alberts, I never would have suggested that I could come up and sing with them. So, no, the reason that happened was, um, was strictly because of Clifford, you know, pushing people together. Albert King was never an easy person for anyone to approach. And for Clifford to, I just remember him having a serious conversation with Albert. And the next thing I knew, uh, Stevie was on stage. Stevie was always this very humble guy that looked up to all the older musicians. He didn't realize just how talented he was. The first night Stevie uh, sat in with Albert King, it was Clifford who got him up there, you know. He, Clifford was saying, you got to hear this kid. Now that was one of the greatest nights I ever remember. You got to realize, you know, this was Stevie Vaughn, not Stevie Ray Vaughn, first of all. This was Jimmy's little brother, Stevie Vaughn. Well, you know, that, that was everything to Stevie. It meant, it just meant everything. I never dealt with, with any of these performers before, and he was a big man, a scary man. It was the one thing in Stevie's life he wanted was to be with Albert King on stage. So he asked me to go ask him. So I did. I went, big man. I said, Mr. King, uh, I have a friend who he really can play and he wants to play. Would it be okay? He said, no. I was, oh, yes, sir. Albert King wouldn't have invited, you know, anybody. I walked back and told Stevie and he said, man, you gotta go ask him again. I said, man, you know, this big old guy. He said, please, man. Clifford saying, you gotta hear this kid. You really gotta hear this kid. So. Albert King finally agreed to do that. He got up there and he was burning, you know, just really playing a great solo. 
time that Albert King was playing with Stevie, and Stevie started ripping off an Albert King solo, and Albert went and hit his guitar behind the curtain and says, honey, you shouldn't see this. And so he would do something really tough, and then Albert would just have to find something else. So they were digging into the bag of tricks, man, and it was the best I'd ever heard Albert King or ever heard Stevie. <laughs> would pull those kind of things off because they trusted him. We were very, very lucky to have a great relationship with the blues guys. Man, oh man, what's up, man? See, they didn't even tell me. They just said you're being interviewed, but they didn't tell me you was going to be in. It's all about you. I could have said some other things about me and you. <laughs> <laughs> Mentioned Buddy Guy. We brought him and Junior Wells for two solid weeks every night. All music, all blue. Well, I came down here once that was Jimmy Rogers, Otis Rush, myself, Junior Wells. Muddy Waters, uh, it just wasn't nobody left in Chicago. I asked, I say, who's in Chicago playing tonight? Albert Collins, who, who would just, of course, light up the room when, when he walked in. You could not meet Albert Collins without feeling better about yourself. Now, that's, that's a heck of a thing to say. If I looked on the calendar and see in two months Albert Collins was coming, it would pick me up and keep me going. And so here Clifford is bringing this guy who's a real, very influential kind of player. And he had this mysterious way of tuning and... A, a sound that was totally different than anybody else. Really an original musical voice. I couldn't believe the guy played as well as he did. His attack on the instrument and his phrasing were like nothing I'd ever heard. Collins loved Derek O'Brien. He loved him. And he always wanted Derek to play rhythm. But then he let him play lead. And Derek's on a Stratocaster, Albert's on a Telecaster. And if you're in the other room, you don't know which one of them's playing. <laughs> Thunderbirds were the house band, and we were the backup house band. So, how did the T Birds become the house band? Well, we wouldn't leave. And we owed our, our, t our bar tabs were so huge, we had to do something to work it off. And they go behind the bar and, and fix drinks and put it on a tab like they were going to pay us. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't stealing it if you put it on the tab. <laughs> and I looked back there one day, we had piles, <laughs> piles of these tabs. Now. What the hell is I was doing a, a benefit for the parks in Big Spring, Texas, and they I asked them who they wanted. They said Willie Nelson. I, I've done benefits there before for other friends <laughs> and other prisons around the country of uh, friends of mine who had uh, gotten off the beaten path there for a second. Well, I woke up this morning and I looked out my door. I could tell my milk cow that Tell 
we all just have become good friends over the years. We've worked with him and doing blues kind of shows. And yeah, that's the greatest blues band that I've ever played with. Well, the only thing different about working with uh, Derek and the guys is that, you know, we play blues every night and have been ever since I can remember. Uh, it used to be called Bob Will's Music. Well, I knew that it all ran together. I think Johnny Gimble said there's only two kinds of music. There's two songs, Star Spangled Banner and the Blues. <laughs> You tunes I want to do for my bros in San Antonio. The Clipper and Anton, this for you, bro. San Antonio guys understood it, that Louisiana music, just like they were from Lafayette. That was an amazing phenomena to me. And Doug understood it as good as anyone in Louisiana. Yeah. On my birthday, every year, he will say, what do you want for your birthday? I want nothing but Doug and the San Antonio boys to be here. That's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You just have to have that force that can't be stopped, and that was Clifford, his stubbornness and his total love and reverence for blues. It was just so obvious to people. There was just no other, no other world, you know, but the blues world. And if he hadn't have been that, that crazy and that stubborn about it, it never would have survived. It never would have made the name it has over the world, you know, for that blues club in Austin. And it just, it wouldn't have happened without that kind of energy. No blues fan living out there will ever forget those shows. That's what got Sue Foley really into the blues. She saw that show. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big, we knew that was never going to happen again. This is what started it all between me and Cliff for this song. told her, send me a tape someday. So when I went back to Canada, I sent him a demo tape. I, I was back in my office at the record company, and I heard it, and I went outside where Derek and all the ladies that worked there said, man, listen to this. I, I don't know if I'm crazy or not. This, this is incredible. Walking around in circles. played that song they all agreed and so I called her up she was in Canada where she lived Walking round in circles, Daddy. And I said, you, you want to come to Austin she said yeah when I said tomorrow I was gonna stay for two weeks and I stayed for like seven years very few places around the country have really felt like you know there's something deeper there you know got to the core of the music not just the not just oh it's great we've got bb king here and let me let me not i know bb king let me introduce you to him bb king's at my club well you know he really cared a lot about bb king's drummer he cared a lot about wayne bennett bobby bland's guitar player he treated them great you know he treated them like kings basically and i think this is something that really carried through and made anton special it made it special to all the guys from chicago all the blues guys, the real guys, it made it a, a place of distinction and a place they really wanted to come. I feel like, you know, Anton, I'm home. Yeah, you home. I'm home. I don't know why you're leaving. That's yeah, what I don't know. Yeah, man, I can't understand you. You another one. 
Scoundbooger. Uh, yeah, you're another one too. Scuttlebuck. Uh, Scuttlebuck. Scoundbooger. Two pair of britches. We're like brothers, you know, and uh, I don't know if there's a word to describe love that deep as I love Hubert. You know. I'm sad. If someone just never heard Muddy Waters or the Howlin' Wolf, and they get a chance to hear one of those records, or they get a chance to hear, hear Elmore James or Little Walter or Magic Sam, it's going to make their life better. Kind of like the soul stripped of all of its jewelry. You know, it's just, it's just raw. It's just bare. It's where we came from. I mean, it's the roots of our life is the blues, whether we know it or not. truthfulness that can only come about when somebody opens up to be completely visible. You hear the uh, anguish and you hear all the, the toil and the trouble. And you hear all of that in the blues and it's, it's, like, a, uh, it's like a howl. Pine Top Prairie is 90 years old, but he'll still find time to come down here and play. You know, man, man gets that age, he's gonna pick his, you know, pick the shows he's gonna do. But the fact that he will come from Chicago down to here and play, at this point in time, he's not looking to showcase himself. You know, that, that says it right there, when you get a 90-year-old man to come down and play at your bar. Uh, I'm glad, I'd be glad to come see him. God Lord, I love, I love Clifford. They got to watch people grow through their whole career at our club and, and things like that. I think that's what uh, people think about when they say Antones or the nightclub or me. It's just that we, we represent the real working musicians. <laughs> 